great. Thanks so much, Paige, and, and thanks so much to Haycast for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and to kick off the Haycast 2020 series of webinars. As Paige said, I am John Haynes. I am Program Manager of Health and Air Quality Applications in the Applied Sciences Program at NASA Earth Science Division here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And for today, I just want to give a bit of an overview of what we do in health and air quality applications in the Applied Sciences Program, as well as talking about a few of the highlights out of many, many highlights of HACAST over the past four years and what's coming up in the future for HACAST as well as in NASA Earth Science and Applied Sciences in general. And for us in Earth Science Division at NASA, it really all begins here. This slide shows the NASA Earth fleet of operating and future Earth observing satellites. Currently, NASA is operating 22 satellites and sensors in low Earth orbit, continuously monitoring Earth's weather, climate, and environment for research and applications purposes. Uh, this constellation of 22 satellites and sensors, including several on the International Space Station, represents an investment of almost $2 billion, that's billion dollars with a B, of American taxpayer money per year, allowing NASA to be the largest contributing federal agency to the United States uh, Global Change Research Program. This also represents the largest civilian Earth-observing constellation in the world. Uh, the satellites that you're seeing up here, the ones that are in the colors that are more blue to green, those are the satellites that are currently in orbit. The ones toward the top of the globe in the purples and golds, those are those satellites that we plan to launch from now through 2023 in order to ensure that we keep this as the most robust, robust Earth-observing constellation um, across the globe. Uh, today, you're going to hear me talk about observations from many of these satellites. And um, so I just want to get a little bit of information to some of you who may not be as familiar with Earth observations and how they work about what we're actually seeing from these satellites in orbit. So what you're seeing here is an image in true color from NASA MODIS. Now NASA MODIS is uh, a really workhorse for the agency. Uh, it is a satellite sensor that's on board both the Terra and Aqua satellites. MODIS stands for the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, so you can certainly understand why we use acronyms at, at NASA. Uh, but MODIS is really, like I said, a workhorse for the agency and for Earth science. It looks at the Earth in over 30 different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, getting us everything from true color, visible images like you would see with the naked eye, all the way into the infrared so that we can see things such as wildfire locations across the globe. So when you're looking at an image in true color from MODIS, like this image over the Himalayas, you see some, well, cloudiness, haziness, what have you, there over the nations of Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. Now, in true color, we may not could understand exactly what we're looking at here. Are we looking at clouds? Are we looking at smoke? Um, but luckily, again, since MODIS looks at a wide variety of different wavelengths of the spectrum, we can dig deeper into the data and take a look at another MODIS product known as aerosol optical depth. Aerosol optical depth gives us information on the particulate matter loading in a column of the atmosphere. So when we're looking at aerosol optical depth products from this same time, we can actually see that what we're seeing is smoke, aerosols and particulates across the Hindukush. And so this is just one example of what MODIS, and that's just one sensor on two of our satellites, can do uh, when looking at issues of air quality across the globe. But our satellites and sensors in low Earth orbit look at a wide variety of Earth observations, and these are just some examples. We can get land temperature from orbit, sea surface temperature, vegetation density, sea surface salinity, total rainfall, aerosols across the globe, fires and thermal anomalies to be able to pick out where wildfires exist, chlorophyll or ocean color that gives us information on things such as harmful algal blooms, and also sea surface height to understand how sea surface is changing across the globe and how it is increasing on average across the planet in our globally warmed world. So as I mentioned, the HACAS program and here at, with myself, we all sit in the NASA Applied Sciences Program. The NASA Applied Sciences Program's mission is to discover and demonstrate innovative and practical uses of Earth observations in organizations' policy, business, and management decisions. And we do this across all sectors. We work with local governments, state governments, regional consortiums, federal government, international uh, agencies and NGOs, as well as with the private sector. 
We have three lines of business uh, that are, are uh, ongoing in the Applied Sciences program. Uh, typically, every 12 to 18 months, we solicit for proposals for applications to prove out, develop, and transition ideas for sustained uses of Earth observations and decision making. We also have a large capacity building program, which I'll mention a little bit later in this talk, that's mission is to build skills and capabilities in the U.S. and developing countries to access Earth observations to benefit society and also to knowledgeably use them in decision making. And we also have a large mission planning program, which is uh, charged to identify applications early in mission life cycles in order to integrate end user needs and mission design and development. So that once these new satellites get on orbit, like those ones earlier I was talking about in the gold and purple colors, the applications can be in right, on, right when they get to orbit instead of having any lag time. So that applications are integrated in mission planning from the very beginning. There are five areas of applications emphasis in the Applied Sciences Program. Of course, the one nearest and dearest to my heart and yours, I'm sure, is the Health and Air Quality Applications Program. But we also have pro programs in water resources, ecological forecasting, disaster management, and agriculture and food security. While, as our budget and capacity allow, we support opportunities in additional areas, including energy, urban development, and transportation infrastructure. Climate and weather, of course, cross-cut all of these areas and are inter integrated fully across the Applied Sciences Program. So why do we have a Health and Air Quality Applications Program at NASA? And I'm proud to say we've had a Health and Air Quality Applications Program at this agency since the very start of Applied Sciences 19 years ago. And the fundamental reason is the potential health effects of climate variability and change, both natural and human-caused climate change issues, which can lead to regional weather changes, such as uh, more intense heat waves, more intense urban heat islands, changes in, extreme, in weather regimes, including more extreme weather events, changes in temperature and precipitation regimes as well, which those lead to changes in air pollution levels and how air pollution is infected across the globe. Health effects coming from these regional weather changes include heat-related illnesses and deaths, of course, the health effects of extreme weather events, and again, when you're going into the air quality side, air pollution-related health effects, as well as taking a look at issues of water and foodborne diseases, as well as vector and rodent-borne diseases. And so the portfolio here in NASA Health and Air Quality Applications covers all of these issues. In fact, currently we have 32 active projects in the portfolio, which is the largest uh, portfolio project that's, that we have ever undertaken uh, here at the agency. So nothing that we're going to really talk a lot about today, being that this is a Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team talk. Well, we have... Uh, a wide variety of projects looking at the issue of vector-borne diseases, particularly these emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases globally. Uh, this map is from September 2017, and unfortunately, um, as uh, you can see in the news every day, we could probably just add more diseases to this global map currently, uh, such as the new novel coronavirus that has certainly been a uh, um, huge news item over the past uh, month or so. Now, when we're looking at NASA emerging, re-emerging diseases, vector-borne diseases, we certainly can't tackle all the diseases listed on this map. But the ones that we can tackle are the ones, uh, the diseases that are vector-borne or infectious diseases that have some type of environmental parameter behind their spread or the habitat of the vector, and also that we can remotely sense that environmental parameter from orbit. If that is the case, then that is where we can actually have projects. And we have a wide variety of projects with vector-borne diseases and international and domestic agencies looking at issues such as West Nile virus in the Northern Great Plains, malaria in Peru, malaria in South Asia and Myanmar, as well as a variety of other, other cases. Um, and we can certainly get you more information on that if you're interested, but will not be the main topic of this talk today. Main topic of this talk today is going to be the issue, of course, of air pollution and the environmental health risks that come from air pollution. This graphic is from the World Health Organization, uh, which estimates that every year there's around 7 million excess deaths due to exposure for both outdoor and household air pollution globally, including over 2 million in the Southeast Asia region alone. So when you're taking a look at the portfolio of projects that I said ought that I mentioned earlier is now 32 active projects in the portfolio for health and air quality. These are really the objectives that we look at. Supporting the use of earth observations and air quality management in public health, particularly regarding infectious disease and environmental health issues. 
uh, promoting the use of earth observation data and model uh, predictive capabilities regarding the implementation of air quality standards, policies, and regulations. And as I mentioned, um, overall, uh, as it's a cross-cutting issue, looking at the effects of climate change on public health and air quality to support managers and policymakers in their planning and preparations for the years and decades to come. Now, when you're taking a look there at the partners we're including at the bottom, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. This is just an example of some of the partners that we work with. Internationally, that includes the International Group on Earth Observations, the World Health Organization, many UN organizations, including UNICEF, as well as the Pan American Health Organization. Federally, we work very closely with the CDC, EPA, NIH, and NOAA. In fact, we just recently, a few months ago, celebrated 15 years of official partnership with the CDC with a celebratory symposium at CDC headquarters in Atlanta. We work with a wide variety of state departments of health and departments of environmental quality, including, for example, South Dakota, California, Texas, and many others, and also in the private sector, including AER Incorporated. But this is not an exhaustive list, just some examples. So I wanted to give um, some examples of the successes of the environmental health and air quality applications portfolio uh, here at NASA over the past few years, and then get a little deeper in, into the health and air quality applied sciences team itself. Uh, what you're looking at here is a project that was led by Dr. Phil Dickerson at the Environmental Protection Agency on improving air quality maps with satellite data. Specifically, this is on the EPA Air Now system. Now, when you're looking over on the left-hand side of the screen, all those areas in green are areas where the EPA, based on their ground-based PM2.5 monitors, can determine PM2.5 levels across the continental United States. But as you could tell, that leaves a lot of areas out. Um, so the EPA approached us and said, what if we looked at integrating MODIS aerosol optical depth data, which I was discussing earlier, into the air now system with the ground data. And let's see if we can then get a more representative view of true PM 2.5 levels across the United States. And as many of you know, particulate matter 2.5 micron is one of the criteria pollutants for the EPA. Uh, its health effects are very well known due to the small size of the particulate matter. It gets very deep into lungs, causing inflammatory responses throughout the body, leading to issues of such as cardiovascular disease and exacerbating issues of COPD, bronchitis, and other respiratory ailments. So when you're looking at the upper right-hand side, you can actually see an air, now, uh, an air Now run over the state of Missouri in 2013 that did not include data from NASA MODIS. Now, we can look at the true color MODIS image and see that there is smoke over central Missouri from wildland fires. But so if you include the aerosol optical depth information from MODIS into the Air Now system at the bottom right-hand corner, you can now see that that smoke is now reflected in the Air Now run. We get a much more representative view of what true PM 2.5 levels are across the country. Uh, this system is now operational at the airnowtech.org site listed there. It's not open to the public. It is only open to air quality managers, but the registration for the site is free. And based on now having this satellite-based PM 2.5 information, we can now cover all areas of the United States that are in the green and blue, which is a huge increase in the amount of people and aerial coverage of the country. And you can see there at the bottom a testimonial from Minnesota's Pollution Control Agency, one of many uh, state uh, air quality agencies that are using this information. As part of this uh, program, we actually did a socioeconomic benefit study to see what was the monetary impact uh, with the EPA of doing this project. And what we learned was that without satellite data, if the EPA had gone out on their own and procured ground monitors for PM 2.5 and established them in all the blue areas of the country that they needed to get this same type of information, that would have cost them about $26 million in their budget. While we were able to provide this information for free, because all of NASA's Earth observation data is free and available to the globe. Uh, again, we found that the inclusion of the satellite data now provides PM 2.5 information to 82% of the people living in currently unmonitored by ground monitor locations. And that represents an additional 15 million people that are now covered with PM 2.5 information. Uh, Dr. Roscoe Porbiazar at the University of Alabama in Huntsville has worked very closely with the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality to improve uh, their air quality decision support systems in Texas that they use to design their latest state implementation plans. As uh, many of you well know, the temporal and spatial location of clouds have a very large impact 
on the projected air quality given a set of emissions. So this uh, project was looking at using Earth observation data to improve cloud locations and timing that are now that are then ingested into the air quality model used to plan acceptable emissions in the state of Texas. Uh, the state of Texas was so excited and, and uh, impressed by the success of this project that they actually contributed an additional half million dollars in funding to NASA Applied Sciences to expand the scope of this project. Looking at from the air quality regulatory side more to the environmental health side, uh, Jeff Pierce at Colorado State University uh, partnered with the, I mean, with the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment to develop a smooth health smoke health impact assessment forecaster. Uh, this was to develop a tool that could be used by public health officials to determine the health impact of smoke plumes from wildland fires in the western United States, particularly talking here about the state of Colorado. They also again used NASA MODIS aerosol optical depth, surface measurements, and other model data to estimate smoke exposure from past fires. And then they combined that with health data to determine the associated health effects of smoke exposure in a retrospective sense in order to calibrate this model before they can then let it go into the forecasting mode. You can, and it, this is open to the public. You can certainly go there to the Colorado State University website and take a look at Smoke Forecaster, and you can actually get information on where smoke plume, smoke plume PM 2.5 levels will be over the next 24 and 48 hours, which has uh, been a great tool for people at the Department of Public Health and the Environment in Colorado. So let's jump into HACAS, really one of the crown jewels of our program here at NASA. Uh, the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team, whose mission is to connect NASA data and tools with health and air quality stakeholders, uh, started four years ago in 2016 with 13 investigators, uh, led by Dr. Tracy Holloway of the University of Wisconsin, who you'll be hearing from later this afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Tracy has done an absolutely outstanding job in leading this team. And when we say 13 investigators, that's just the principal investigator. The HACAS funded community is actually much larger because many of these investigators have uh, co-investigators, grad students, collaborators, so it's even a much larger team than the 13 listed here. Uh, the, uh, as you well know, this is the first of stakeholder webinars that began today and will be going on through February and March. Uh, the HACAST also has a joint workshop planned with the Environmental Protection Agency in June 2020 at Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. And this is all leading up to the final showcase of HACAST success that will be held July 21st and 22nd of 2020 here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Again, HACAST was a four-year applied sciences team, so a four-year period of performance, starting in 2016 and ending this summer. So how does HACAST work? HACAST works in basically four areas, direct collaboration with end users and stakeholders, as well as then supporting advanced users, supporting novice users of earth observation data, and also broadly disseminating the results and successes of these collaborations. You can see there on the upper left-hand side is attendance at HACAST meetings, just the first five of them. We've had uh, two more, HACAST 6 and HACAST 7 after this, and I'm proud to say that the attendance has just continued to increase. These meetings have been held by HACAST every six months in different regions in the United States in order to bring the message of what, what are Earth remote sensing capabilities directly to the stakeholders, and then to have listening sessions with the stakeholders in order to understand what their needs are. So these have been great collaborative meetings in order to understand on the stakeholder end user side, what are NASA's capabilities, what are HACAS capabilities, and then on the end user stakeholder side for us to understand what are their needs and where does that Venn diagram overlap? And that is where we can then collaborate in new short-term Tiger Team projects with those end users and stakeholders. Uh, I'm but proud to say that Arlene Fiore and her team have created technical guidance documents for policy use among the air quality stakeholder community, including guides to using satellite images in support of exceptional event demonstrations. Uh, we have had well over 60, and I'm talking about well over 60 papers published, again, part of that broad dissemination of information to the community. And you can also see in the upper right-hand corner how uh, Principal Investigator Dr. Mark Zonlo of Princeton has worked directly with states such as Colorado to map ammonia emissions that are coming from those large farms, agriculture, um, feedlot operations that are occurring that occur out in the West. And certainly, as I'll talk about in a minute, all of this information archived and easily accessible on the HACAST website. 
So I could speak for an hour on the highlights of Haycast over the past four years. So I'm only going to give a few examples. I'm sure today at four o'clock, Tracy will give far more examples. But this one is a really great news story that has gotten a lot of positive media attention for Haycast and NASA, as well as the EPA. Um, one of our instruments on board the NASA R satellite is called OMI, the Ozone Monitoring Instrument. And as its name suggests, uh, OMI looks at ozone, but it also looks at other criteria pollutants, such as nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide globally. Now, nitrogen oxide is a pollutant that is a criteria pollutant to EPA, unhealthy to breathe in any case, but it also contributes to the formation of unhealthy levels of surface ozone pollution, primarily emitted from tailpipes and smokestacks. Now, as you can see from 2005, which was a year after OMI was launched, to 2016, uh, we have been able to show that there's been a 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 percent decrease over most of the United States in NO2 levels over those 10 years. And this did not happen by accident. We just didn't stumble into this. This is because of the tougher environmental regulations under the Clean Air Act. This is because of increases in technology for smoke scrubbing uh, in different types of power plants, uh, pollutant scrubbing. This is also because of increased CAFE regulations for vehicle gas mileage. And, and it's also due in large part to getting away from from coal-based uh, coal based power, getting more into the cleaner burning natural gas uh, um, power that the United States has shifted to over the past 10 years. This is a huge success story. And uh, keep in mind, we have been able to clean up our air uh, thanks to all of these uh, regulations to where now the United States air quality is the cleanest it's been in the modern industrial age. And this happened while we increased the number of vehicle miles driven, while we increased our gross domestic product, and while we increased U.S. population. You can just see there in Washington, D.C. alone from 2005 to 2016 that NO2 has decreased by 50 percent. Um, as I mentioned, NO2 uh, is a contributor to the formation of surface ozone. Uh, when I first moved to Washington, D.C. in the early 2000s, there were probably red alert days issued for ozone several times each summer, where the Washington uh, governments would, uh, metropolitan governments would make, for example, public bus service free in order to encourage people to get out of their cars because ozone was so high. Washington, D.C. hasn't had a red alert day for ozone in now nine years. So that is just one of the ways to, just, to uh, illustrate how much our air quality has improved. The EPA loves this information because it shows that their air quality regulations are working. And in fact, the EPA has included these, uh, these OMI observations in their air trends reports every year since 2016 as part of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards Chapter. And if you look at SO2, uh, which is certainly uh, another criteria pollutant precursor to things such as acid rain, you're seeing the same improvement in our air quality. And we get SO2 data from OMI as well. So this has been a huge success story led by HACAS principal investigators. Dr. Susan O'Neill at the U.S. Forest Service, again, one of our principal investigators on HACAS, has facilitated the integration and adoption of satellite products for decision-making with wildland fire smoke exposure. And you can see down at the bottom, she has a, a, a cast of, you can't say cast of thousands, I suppose, but cast of many end users and stakeholders that are part of this project including NOAA uh, and the University of Swanson and National Park Service, as well as the Wild Land Fire Air Quality Response Program. Uh, they have been able to take NASA remotely sensed products to help inform the public about smoke impacts from wildfires. And these have included one-page smoke forecasts that are available at wildlandfiresmoke.net and um, also web tools. Now, all of this uh, remote sensing information that feeds into these smoke outlets come from a variety of sensors including NASA MODIS, VIRS, NOAA GOES, NASA Calypso, MISER, as well as TRIPOMI information that comes from the European Space Agency. Uh, again, as part of that capacity building, Susan O'Neill's team has provided training on how to knowledgeably use these smoke outlooks, including online videos and in-class trainings. And you can just see an example over on the right-hand side of if you access these smoke outlooks, what information you're going to be getting um, about a particular area that will be impacted by wildland fire smoke and what will be the anticipated air quality to be seen in that area over the next 48 hours. 
Uh, we have partnered, HACAST has partnered with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to begin to look at the issues of air quality over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this was being led by Dr. Brian Duncan and Dr. Ann Thompson of Goddard Space Flight Center, who partnered with BOEM to evaluate the current capabilities of satellite data for air quality monitoring and emissions validation over the Gulf. This was a feasibility study, including ground, uh, including uh, surface cruises using um, um, uh, in situ monitors, as well as satellite data, to identify what resources could aid BOEM in monitoring the impact of offshore pollution on inland communities. And this is, again, offshore pollution coming from the Gulf of Mexico oil rigs and platforms. Uh, this project uh, began in summer 2019 with a field campaign again to measure the surface to validate the information we were getting from NASA satellite data. Um, and I'm proud to say that this collaboration has continued through 2020 uh, with actually Boeing contributing um, almost a half million dollars uh, to NASA HACAS in order to expand this study. It's been a great success. I mentioned earlier that part of that broad dissemination of information from NASA HACAS has been an amazing website that they have developed featuring NASA tools and data uh, in consultation with our, our Applied Scientist Remote Sensing Training Program known as RSET. Uh, going to the HACAS website, you just see a wide variety of information on NASA tools, data, uh, products, and how to get started in using those in a knowledgeable manner. This includes how to how-to videos for some of the most useful tools for HACAS stakeholders that includes Worldview and Giovanni um, and other types of short videos uh, that are available uh, through the YouTube channel. So if you haven't had an opportunity to take a look at this, I certainly encourage you to. So what's next for HACAS? As I mentioned earlier in this talk, HACAS is a four-year applied sciences team began in 2016 and is now coming toward the end of its hugely successful run, but that is not the end end. Uh, NASA is going to recompete HACAS for an additional four-year term through a NASA ROSES 2020 solicitation. This is ROSES, for those of you that don't know, stands for Research Opportunities in Space and Earth Sciences. It's NASA's omnibus solicitation vehicle that is issued every year. Uh, the HACAS Recompete, which is open to everybody, so I want to make that clear, it is not simply open only to the ones who are currently serving on HACAS, it is open to the whole community, is element A.38 of ROSES 2020. Uh, this solicitation was released on Friday, on Valentine's Day. It's always a uh, bit of a pun at NASA that we issue roses every year on Valentine's Day as our gift to the community. Uh, notices of intent are not required, but are requested by April 17, 2020, with proposals due on May 29, 2020. We estimate that there will be about 12 to 15 awards, so we anticipate a team of about the same size as the current HACAS, with a budget of approximately $2 million per year. This does not include, though, the Tiger Team funds that are uh, a lot of times the, the very meat of HACAS that are decided after the HACAS team is uh, formed and begins to meet with stakeholders. That budget of $2 million per year is the core funding that will go to each one of the investigators uh, to pay for their time, expertise, travel, and effort. Awards are set to begin in October 2020, so HACAS will be coming to an end this summer but we expect to pick up right at the beginning of fiscal year 2021 with the HACAS version 2.0. For additional details, that's a very long website, I know, uh, and a complicated one, uh, but I know that these slides will be available uh, to the community after my webinar. But if you click on that link, it will take you to the NASA Inspires webpage, which is uh, NASA's webpage for all things to do with submitting proposals to the agency. And there you can find the full terms of the solicitation and how you can apply. I did want to mention uh, before we go into questions, uh, I did mention the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program briefly. It uh, sits at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Our set is a wonderful capacity building uh, capability of the agency that provides end users with professional technical workshops, uh, not only online through webinars, but also in person, not only domestically, but also internationally, allowing us to build um, a knowledgeable capability worldwide of how to use Earth remote sensing data for societal benefit. If you visit the RSAT website, you will find archived all previous webinars, case studies, as well as a calendar of upcoming trainings. 
Uh, you do not need prior remote sensing background in order to take these trainings. Some of them are basically remote sensing 101. Some are more complicated for more uh, sophisticated users. Uh, this is all part of, the, of our applied scientist program because, again, we get terabytes, literally terabytes of data every day and week downloaded from orbit of Earth observations. And all that data is then made into products. And those products do provide information. It's kind of the last step in that spectrum. That information has to become knowledge for the end user community. And that's kind of the biggest step because you want to have capacity built across the community to be able to knowledgeably apply that information for societal benefit so it's not used in an incorrect manner. And that is where RSET has come into play. And RSET has been a wonderful partner to HACAS throughout its four year term. Looking forward to the future, uh, as I mentioned, through 2023, we have a lot of satellites coming on board to help keep us at NASA having the most robust Earth-observing constellation of, in the globe. But two satellites in particular are going to be very important for the air quality and environmental health community. That includes the TEMPO mission, known as Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. TEMPO will be our first uh, air quality satellite launched to geostationary orbit, or geo, meaning that it will be continuously staring at greater North America. So we're going to be able to monitor the air we breathe across greater North America hour by hour in the daylight time. Uh, we will be getting observations from TEMPO of ozone, NO2, and formaldehyde. And it will form part of a global air quality constellation in geostationary orbit with two very similar sister instruments, Copernicus Sentinel-4 of Europe and the Korean GEM satellite. The Korean GEM satellite, which will launch later this month, will be always looking at air quality across East Asia, while the ESA Copernicus Sentinel-4 satellite, which will also launch probably in about 2022, will be looking at Europe and North Africa. So we will get a global view of air pollution across the Northern Hemisphere. EPA and NOAA are partners on the science team for TEMPO. The instrument is completed and delivered, expected to launch in 2022. We also have Maya coming up in 2022 for launch. Maya represents the first time NASA has ever partnered with epidemiologists and health organizations to use space-based data to study human health and improve lives. The multi-angle imager for aerosols is going to be a targeted satellite, uh, a satellite that it will be able to target megacities from low Earth orbit to observe particulate matter types in megacities that also have epidemiological or cohort health studies that are ongoing. So we hope to be able to link PM uh, PM levels in those cities with health studies in those cities to look at issues such as adverse birth outcomes, cardiovascular and respiratory disease, and premature death. This satellite is led by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and expected to launch in 2022 as well. There is also, I just wanted to briefly mention that in 2017, the National Research Council, the National Academies of Science, issued their new Earth Science Decadal Survey to cover us through 2027, known as Thriving on Our Changing Planet. These decadal surveys really serve as the guiding light for our priorities here at NASA Earth Science as we plan for the decade to come. You can see there that they have listed, and it's a very large report, going on about 700 pages, but uh, if you want to pull out some of the priorities that they've been talking about for air quality, I've listed them here. Certainly, number one, determine the effects of key boundary level uh, uh, pollutants when you're talking about air quality forecasts. Uh, Groundy layer processes are critical, as we know, to air quality forecasts, because that's nose level. That's where we people live and breathe. And we have to be able to uh, improve our ability to tease out these boundary layer pollutants from the column that we typically observe uh, when we're talking about air quality observations from space. The upcoming launch of Tempo and its Korean and European partners is going to allow, though, for us to have unprecedented high temporal and spatial resolution measurements of ozone, aerosols, and their precursors of the, in the troposphere that will create a revolutionary data set to help to address these priorities, as well as many others. Uh, the Decadal Survey has set out four designated observables that they want NASA to tackle through new Earth, uh, Earth science missions over the next 10 years. The one most important for this community is the aerosol cloud convection and precipitation designated observable known as ACCT. Uh, we are currently in the planning stages for what a mission would look like to tackle these observations uh, for aerosols, cloud convection and precipitation, including hosting workshops that are bringing the community together to discuss the 
potential for ACCP geophysical variables to be assimilated into operational modeling frameworks, both domestically and worldwide. Uh, I encourage you to visit our NASA Earth Science Decadal Survey website, which where you will see a lot more information on how we are beginning our planning for these designated observables, including ACCP. And we're also hosting community workshops uh, every couple months uh, that will give the community an update on our status and how we are moving forward in tackling the Decatur survey here at NASA. The next one, I believe, is coming up um, in the second week in March. And with that said, I think I've left hopefully about 15 or so minutes for questions. I do appreciate your time and you joining us for our first HACAS 2020 webinar today. And I guess now I will just turn it back over to Paige uh, for any questions that may have arisen. Thanks so much.